Hello, everyone. I'm Michael David Fox in the Pictures Series. And I am very pleased to uh, introduce Marjorie Mendelssohn Balazer. And she is a longtime uh, faculty member here at Georgetown. She's a, a faculty fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. She is co convener of the Indigenous Studies Working Group. Um, she has long standing affiliations with Ceres, the Anthropology Department, the Berkeley Center. She is also editor of the journal Anthropology and Archaeology of Eurasia. And she is one of the world's leading experts on uh, indigenous peoples of Siberia and the circumpolar north. Uh, she's our author and editor of six books on Russia, Central Asia, and the north. Uh, including several books on shamanism, including shaman spirituality and cultural revitalization, explorations in Siberia and beyond. So her research interests are really in the intersections of religion, politics, ecology, human rights, and comparative indigenous activism. And today, uh, well, we haven't had too much happy news in the world recently, especially in the last 57 or 58 days, but a book launch is always kind of a happy occasion because it brings to fruition years and years of, of work. And we're here to launch um, Professor Balfour's uh, its book, Galvanizing Nostalgia, uh, in and Sovereignty in Siberia, uh, which came out with Cornell University Press in 2021. Um, it ranges across anthropological and ethnographic, I would say even autobiographical and historical, even economic themes. And so it also made me think of how we who consider ourselves Russia watchers, how geographically small the part of Russia that we often pay attention to is. And so, um, what we're going to do today is have Professor Balzer um, introduce her work and show us images. I have many, many questions having just finished this book. I will limit myself to one or two, depending on what the presentation is, and we'll open it up to discussion. <laughs> Great, thank you, Michael, uh, for that and for um, uh, for for pointing out the uh, issues of. Uh, of relative size inside of Russia, that will be a theme. Uh, before I get into the indigeneity in Siberia issues, I wanted to mention indigeneity here at Georgetown. And one of the things that Georgetown has not done yet is have an official land acknowledgement. But I want to honor the indigenous people whose land, the greater Washington area is occupying, and I want to also especially acknowledge Piscataway and Akaki. In the next year, we're going to have a lot of discussions about Georgetown's land acknowledgement and that it should perhaps be less um, uh, symbolic and, and more uh, activist that there will be some dimension of it that is beyond the symbolism of simple land acknowledgement. Um, now to Siberia, but also to put Siberia and the Far East of Russia into a little bit of context, broader context in this world that we're living in of a horror with Russia's invasion of war in Ukraine. So galvanizing nostalgia, question mark, indigeneity and sovereignty in Siberia. I'll be focusing on three republics, especially where I've, I've, I've done fieldwork. It's the title of the talk is the same as the title of my new book. Um, but the three republics are in what is technically, legally, the Federation of Russia. Uh, and there are areas that this thing is very sensitive. There are areas that I have uh, done field work in. Uh, Sahar Republic, which as you can see is absolutely huge. It used to be called Yakutia. Uh, it's the size of undisputed India. Uh, Buryatia, 
along like BICOM, which I hope all of you, especially serious students, have heard of, know about, maybe even visited, and this is, is the jewel of the Far East. And Buryatia used to be a lot bigger. So greater Buryatia was kind of gerrymandered. Uh, the Ust, Orda, and Aga are districts inside of uh, what would have been Greater Buryatia. And then Tuvan, and they like to pronounce it Tliva, um, on the border with Mongolia, a republic in itself of people who are um, Turkic speakers and who for uh, many years had their own kind of buffer state. They didn't even come into the Russian federation, so-called federation, until 1944. Um, Sahar, the farthest north, Turkic speakers, uh, and uh, Buryat are Mongolic speakers. So it gives you a bit of a picture, but a further picture, and all of the words I'm using are in some ways um, problematic. There are questions about how we define indigenous people, how we define sovereignty, and so indigenous peoples of the North Siberia and the Far East in Russian law are only those people who are so-called small numbered people, who so have less than 50,000 in their populations. But in UN, United Nations terms, peoples with republics inside of Russia also are indigenous. And they certainly, in many cases, consider themselves to be indigenous. And they have a slightly better chance at some degree of sovereignty, of nested sovereignty, of so negotiation with Moscow, than peoples who have no land districts or base at all, or much smaller ones. Um, so here, the book that you see is featuring actual republic seals, some sort of sense of sovereignty and identity that happened after the Soviet Union broke up. As people whole huge territories inside of Russia came into their own and began to feel that they would have a chance for cultural and political revitalization. And this is what was going on, especially in the 90s when I got very excited. My first field work was in 86, but then I went back every year of the 90s or practically every year. And then it started getting a little bit less and less with Putin administration. So here we are with the tie-in to the issues of the day. Non-Russians fighting inside the Russian army on Russia's side, but not necessarily willingly. Maybe a bigger percentage of the actual army because they're poor, impoverished from rural areas than the people who are Russians from the big cities. And so we're estimating, and we really don't know, but a lot of experts have been trying to figure this out. Is it a fourth of the army? Is it, is it a whole third? As I've heard one activist say, um, they are not happy, and they are certainly not happy at being accused of atrocities that Russians perpetrated, ethnic Russians, inside of Kucha. This is really an example of a false flag operation. That's the Saha national flag. These are people who on Russian media were actually called Gloria, even though they're Saha. There's a big difference between these groups in their own minds as they self-identify. They're not all one thing, Siberian indigenous. And so here they are in a happy picture that turns out to have probably been taken about two years ago on Army Day, but it was advertised as having taken place. What an odd picture for Bucha there. But then I thought, why? And although I've been studying and talking to people for years about issues of national identity inside of Russia, I didn't get it until somebody pointed out to me that this is really about racism. It's about, oh, where these wild Siberian natives who could commit atrocities, let's not put it onto the brother Slavs. Let's put Bucha onto other people like Chechens. Mm -hmm. Only we're even wilder than Chechens, my interlocutor said. So this gives you something of a picture of what's going on. The other part, and this is Russian propaganda and all the other things that go with it. The other part of this that we need to understand is why Putin went into Ukraine when he didn't. We're all speculating. 
Navalny has said, among other major reasons, not having to do with international affairs, are the problems inside Russia itself that Putin might have wanted sort of diversion from. A short victorious war, let's pull everybody together, let's not worry about ethnic tensions. Well, this slide brings us back to some of my first field work in Saha Republic, in Yakutsk, and ethnic tensions critically being demonstrated right when I had first moved there in 86, at the beginning of the Gorbachev era. Now, this picture looks like a lot of kids playing on an ice rink, and it's not an ethnic brawl. But just several days before that, in this very same spot, an inter-ethnic brawl had happened, and Russian soldiers had beat up on mm -hmm. Saha young people. A couple of girls landed in the hospital. Saha students were furious. I was living in the dorms. Of course I knew Saha were furious. And they marched down Lenin Prospect to Lenin Square and demanded to see the chief of police. And this was an astonishing demonstration for those days. And so this slide sort of represents that. A lot of the students of that activism got in trouble. But the authorities, communists, were in 86 at this point, actually had to kind of paper it over. Some of the students were uh, expelled from the university. I was a uh, <clears throat> command appearance required to stand under the Lenin statue on Lenin Square on the viewer stand with the Communist Party elites and watch the university students go by in a parade. And the banner says, greetings to the brotherly friendship of the peoples of the USSR. So the propaganda was, was there. The underlying was ethnic conflict already. And here, another reason people at first didn't want me to go to the Far East and do field work was they didn't want me to see the poverty. This is a long time ago, 86 slide, uh, where people are actually getting water from the street corner. They don't have the water from their own houses. A lot of these have been torn down now, high rises have been put up. But nonetheless, Saha are going back and forth. And this is true of a lot of Siberian communities. Uh, the image of urbanization and that's it is probably not right. There's an enormous amount of interaction. This happens to be a, a shot of a uh, uh, mayor of a large town in, in uh, the north, um, in the Kolyma, notorious for prison camps, going back home for the haying season to help his mother in the village, the Zoryasada village. And this kind of represents some of the themes of my talk. Um, this is a muckraking journalist, a journalist who didn't much like his Russified name, Ivan uh, Nikolaev, and decided to take the name Ukhan, which means the great in Saha. And he's valorizing, he's in a pageantry that valorizes the epics from which a lot of Saha regained a lot of confidence and values. And they're, 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 they're taking the spirit of the epics and making them their own and modernizing, picking and choosing. But Wuhan uh, actually told me at one point that he thinks he's living in the wrong century. He, he would have liked to have been living in the time of the epics. And that kind of gave me a clue. Here's some more of the cultural revitalization, and I'm going to speed this up so that we do have time for, for, for questions, but it's spiritual revitalization, healing, shamanic healing and spirituality, but in new forms. Um, and so laughter therapy, um, I was with these folks for 10, 10 different sessions. They ended up with a prayer, we are Saha, we are in and with this land. Here in the city, one of the major temples has been created instead of a church. They didn't have this for their spirituality before. Um, it's a gorgeous place filled with light inside called House of Purification. And one of the other big foci for the cultural revitalization and spiritual, and also political and solidarity with, with uh, Saha people as far as this north non-Islamic Turkic people is a ceremony, a, a celebration of the summer solstice. Now you can imagine how important sun is in this part of the world. This is the Minister of Culture, Andre Savage Borisa, who is also by profession a theater director. He had um, been very, very crucial for many, many years 
uh, starting in the late Soviet period, all through the 90s, well into the Putin administration, longest running minister of culture, amazing guy, always landing on his feet politically. And he was part of the impetus for the revival of these ceremonies. Um, this is Andre looking a little bit like a British officer leading the entire uh, Saha, uh, as it's called, summer solstice, which includes a white priestly shaman making offerings of fermented mare's milk to the fire, cast of thousands, absolutely crucial for politicians to show up to dance. Um, this is the first president of the Republic uh, in the suit, Western business suit, confident Saha. Second president of the Republic, diamond magnet, wearing Saha clothing in respect for the local people. And here is the third president of Saha. I was actually honored to be at the inauguration and it was quite a ceremony. Are you having, am I in your way? No, I can I'm suddenly see. realizing. Okay. Here we have um, Igor Borisov, uh, appointed by uh, Putin with a very pomp and ceremony kind of uh, inauguration, it almost looks like an old boyar's hat that's about to be put on top of him, and the Saha flag as well as Russian. Much of Saha's reputation is built around diamonds. The Saha Republic has, as they like to say, the entire Mendeleev table. This is a land of enormous resources. Um, diamonds especially, they've got about 98% of Russia's diamonds. Uh, and this is the, at its height, second largest open pit mining pit in the world uh, at Mirny. And of course, along with this kind of, of uh, from local point of view, for many people, devastation of ecology, uh, enormous amounts of industrial uh, pollution have been part of the diamond industry, as well as huge accidents. One a couple of years ago, the Al Rasa company has taken over from Saha leaders, Russian majority owned now, didn't used to be. Here, protests, protests have been going on in this part of the world for a long time, even though we keep hearing only protests in Moscow and Petersburg. So here, 2008 protest um, uh, against the pipeline and some oil spills that had happened in the Lina River, the great river that flows north. Um, but there were also further demonstrations against unfair elections and rigged election of Putin in 2011, 2019 more ecology protests, 2021 pro Navalny actions. Saha are quite aware as well as other indigenous people in this region, uh, Ivani, Ivanki, Yukir, uh, these communities are quite aware of the changes of, 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 of climate and of serious ramifications, repercussions. Uh, there's a kind of reputation that they don't make the connection with industrialization. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of people I've talked to in villages in the North know perfectly well, um, and uh, others who have studied this issue in Saha know perfectly well that the flooding is abnormal. The fire is, of course, abnormal. This is one of the only pictures I really haven't taken myself. It's from TAS from last year. Uh, but fires, enormous fires, devastation of territories beyond belief out of control. And this um, out of control fire came very close to the World Heritage Site, uh, the Lenat Cliffs, one of the most important of the absolutely magnificent sites on the Lena River. Um, coal as well, uh, uh, mining in this area has uh, been threatening the sacred, and this is really sacred land sites. I'm moving to Boreatia now and, 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 and the sacred Lake Baikal. Um, new villas on Lake Baikal, especially near um, Irkutsk, in the Irkutsk region in the western side of Baikal, are uh, uh, the sort of Western oriented and these are Russian oligarch villas, even Chinese ownership villas, little Russian church in the background. But on the poor, less developed side is the, the Goryat side, the Eastern Baikal. Um, here, 
the president of uh, Boriatia greeting his people on the Lunar New Year in 2021, Alexei Sembienov was appointed by uh, Putin as an economist and engineer. He also knows very well his own people and their orientation and respect for the Lunar New Year, which became a, a national holiday within the Republic. And so this is an annual event. Um, there's been some protesting, but a little bit less in Boria in terms of street protests. I talked about gerrymandering and amalgamations and the, the problem of uh, greater Buryatia versus what Republic boundaries are today. Well, one woman, an anthropologist, Blue Bavayerova in 2013, did a, 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 a demonstration that protested this amalgamation. And then Dmitry Bayerov in 2021 was arrested covering pro Navalny demonstrations. Demonstrators have been arrested very quickly as they protest over language issues and various other issues um, and over issues of Ukraine. Uh, there is an emigre group that has put out now two videos. And if anyone's interested, I can help you find them. Um, against the war in Ukraine. But earlier, the Precious Lake Baikal and its very important pipeline threat was protested by a lot of people, multi-ethnic group, Russians and, and Boryat working together. And this says no to the pipeline around Baikal, and they actually won. They won that the pipeline wouldn't come so close to Baikal. The other hand, it went north along the Rena River. Um, language Day in Boryatia, let me move on. The importance of the Volga Monastery in the Boryat area is enormous for all Buddhists of Russia, for pilgrimages of Buddhists. I can tell you more about Yitzhak in question answer if you want. This is quite a story, but this is a pilgrimage site now all the more so as they've dug up this um, mummified llama. And shamanism here too has been very much, and I don't usually use the word ism, but very much revived in a specific Goryat Mongolic form. Um, this is uh, honoring the mountain god Bukhunayon, a ceremony in which a Mongolian woman was actually an apprentice, the woman um, at the far edge. And here a spirit has sat inside of, uh, of the shaman, and here, did I mention animal sacrifice? We have, uh, uh, I hope I'm not offending anyone, a, uh, a, a serious distribution of meat in these ceremonies after the ceremony. And the last slide of, of Boryatia is uh, on the sacred island of Okhan in the middle of, of Lake Baikal, where importance of three religions come together. Um, now we're moving to Tuva, or Piva, as they like to say, on the 100th anniversary of supposedly Tuva's accession to Russia, with you-know-who in the forefront, and the defense minister Shoigu and the president of the republic on either side of him, celebrating what was basically just a treaty between Russia and Tuva, but they made it into a Russia's accession, uh, absorption of, of, of Tuva. Um, here's Minister Shoigu, and he's disappeared. I don't know if you Russia watchers know for the last week, he's the Minister of Defense of Russia has disappeared, presumably a uh, heart attack. Anyway, he's Tuvan. And so going back to his roots in his homeland and showing President Putin around became a very, very big deal. He's got multiple identities, like everyone, situational identities. So here you go. Um, one of the things that's really important here, in addition to multiple identities, is the phenomenon of what happens when people actually get um, de-radicalized. You know, we're always looking for, you know, hothead youths who then turn into great statesmen. And I wouldn't necessarily say that Bill today is a, a Nelson Mandela, but this is a guy who actually, as an historian, was also one of the leaders of a movement, a party called Free Tuba. It happened in 1990. And 
he then became the head of the parliament and a great you no know, leader of his people to be to have been with inside inside of, of the Russian Federation, not radical and not separatist anymore. Here's the, something of a proof that Tuva did have its own state. These are collector's items, the, the stamps of Tuva before uh, 1944. Um, restless youth, I call this, at the center of Asia on the MSA. These youth are unemployed in huge numbers. Tuva, as one of the most impoverished parts of Russia, has uh, serious problems of unemployment only rivaling the North Caucasus up to as much as 30% unemployment. Um, and this is part of why they go into the army in the first place. But the center of Asia is also disputed because there's another place in China that makes the same claim. Um, here we get into themes of, of crossover Turkic Mongolic peoples and Eurasianism. And I do deal with a lot of the politics of Eurasianism in the book. This actually is a Buryat sculptor who helped add to that center of Asia monument on the Yenisei River for the Tubans. He was commissioned, very popular, and you have a kind of romantic view of the ancient uh, hunting people. More about Buddhism, the village Kore and a, a monk who had come back from the Dalai Lama's community. More Buddhism with Russian uh, uh, church in the background, outside of Kazil, and the heads of the uh, uh, Buddhist community, the Hamba Lama, in various forms I've had interviews with them. Uh, Mangus Kinin Lapsam is a folklorist who just passed away, we're mourning him, who actually became a shaman and folk healer as well. He had had it in his background and became one of the leaders also of the ecology movement in Tuva. This is his protege, Aichurek, White Heart, and more Tuvan slides. We get into this crossover, Turkic Mongolic youth connections and horizontal ties among the republics, sort of under uh, Moscow's radar through issues of Eurasianism and identity. And this is a, a, a picture overlooking Sekhiv Valley near um, Baikal and Orkhan. And here's Shaman Alexander, who I don't have a lot of time to talk about right now, but we can talk about more in question and answer. Um, Shaman Alexander is Saha, but he decided that he wanted to gather far more uh, followers than Saha. He ended up being arrested in Buryatia. He had become very famous and very popular throughout Russia. He was even given international press. But here is part of his walk to Moscow, as he said, to exercise that demon in the Kremlin with a red square ritual. He didn't get that far. He landed in a psychiatric hospital instead. The politicization of psychiatry has accelerated under Putin and is a very serious factor and, and you know, weapons, shall we say, of, of what the Putin administration has been doing to opponents. For some reason, Shaman Alexander was blown way out of proportion, in, including apparently in Putin's mind. I don't know what's in Putin's mind, but supposedly. Redefining federalism is one of our major themes here, and nested sovereignties. This is not necessarily separatism if cultural and political revitalization is allowed to go on. But the theme, and this is true for indigenous peoples everywhere, of nothing about us without us, certainly comes up in this. Is, is fair. But the cases we've been talking about, and I've chosen them strategically, but not just because this is where I've done field work in all three areas, but it's because I wanted to compare and contrast the diversity and contingent histories and legacies. Federalism clearly means something different in Moscow and in the regions, but very pragmatic leaders have emerged. I haven't done much with theory here for you today, but Prasenjit Dwara, the historian of China's concepts of hard and soft boundaries really apply and clearly are going to be devastatingly applicable because of the Ukraine situation. It's very difficult to get back to soft boundaries of inter-ethnic relations once you've had sharp polarization and of course violence, which is why even there's a, a mini 
Chechen war being fought inside of Ukraine right now because there are Chechens on both sides of the fight. Ethnic entrepreneur discourses, it's called in a lot of the anthropological literature or nationalism discourse and political anthropology does not exist in a vacuum. Losing sovereignty when you have it yanked back, bilateral treaties abrogated, triggers polarization. Boundaries matter, as you've seen. Names matter, the Republic names matter a lot to these folks. And appetites for sovereignty were growing until Putin curtailed them. Names matter and comparative activism. Different kinds of issues have sparked different kinds of demonstrations. Demography super matters. The Tevens are just about four fifths. We have a very imperfect census right now uh, that is supposed to come out, but it really was curtailed. Sahara probably over a half of their own population. Buryat's only a third because of the gerrymandering and different kinds of nostalgias. So that's where I leave you with the sacred mountain view of uh, the valley overlooking uh, Yakutsk in Sahara Republic in the next generation. Oh, where to begin? Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll combine two of the questions that I've had because I think they're still they're interconnected in a way and, and relevant. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the connections between the religion and culture on the one hand and activism and especially ecological activism on the other because it's a theme that runs throughout um, and sort of when the cultural and the, you know, the sort of ethnic, ethnic entrepreneurialism, as you put it there, becomes political in different ways. Um, but then it also, I, I couldn't help um, asking about what you refer to in your preface as a Siberian compound in Abinjan where you live and so it led me to think about your participation right in some of these ceremonies and the question for an anthropologist is, is sort of you know how what insight do you get into this the first question from your experience taking part in it and i think another related question would be how you navigate you know the um participatory and sort of going indigenous elements with your analytical, you know, distance, but that's a little too much to answer. Right, I get, I get the drift <laughs> and I'll take in, uh, some of this, uh, by, starting by saying the last fire ceremony I was uh, involved in was last Friday. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it means a lot to, to all of us in our, in our compound. I have a Siberian family living next door. We have uh, my uh, Georgetown professor spouse and I have a, 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 a Siberian family living next door, uh, a Saha Boryat family that we are extraordinarily close to. And sure, nobody is pretending so-called uh, objectivity here. And that's kind of been out the window for a while in anthropology. I need to say that right away. Um, participation and heartfelt being an ally of indigenous people is something I take very, very seriously. And I live it every day of my life. Um, I had an email update from a close friend on Shaman Alexander just this morning. I do want to make it very, very clear though that um, I do not speak for indigenous people. So thanks for giving me this opportunity to just say something really very basic. I'm an ally, I'm closely involved. I have a lot of friends, but I don't pretend to know the entire scene. Indeed, frankly, if we even looked at polling data inside of Russia, we would not have a very good picture, not only because the polls are a mess right now, but they always have been. The founder of the one independent polling center, Yuri Lovato, once told me privately that he regretted enormously that they really didn't have good data on the republics. That's mind blowing. The republics are more than half of Russia's territory. And so what we do have, getting back to your question on religion and ecology, is 
a sense of where people have put their priorities. What do these lands mean? These are homelands. And outsiders, sometimes in conjunction with insiders making development plans, have come in and created one of the biggest diamond industries in the world. They've come in and put in the Power of Siberia pipeline, which is famous going to China. Oil leaks have happened. They were inevitable, and they did happen in some of the other pipelines that were not part of the line. You saw some of those demonstrations. And so people's passions are pretty high. This is not a secret. Although bizarrely, people intelligentsia, and I don't want to overgeneralize Muscovites, tend to have missed the point that a lot of locals are kind of angry about the way their ecology has been despoiled. Baikal is something of an exception because Baikal is a very special sacred gem to all Russians. It's an important, one of the world's biggest freshwater lake, and it is so important in terms of the ecology. So keeping the pipeline away from Baikal was actually something that, that, that Putin made a decision about that was very popular. Putin, incidentally, declared 2017 the year of ecology. Now, one can say this is pretty critical, and so many people did say it at the time, but I decided to kind of go with it and say, great. I mean, if, if, if authorities want to give obeisance to the concept of climate change or the concept that there should be better attention to ecological issues so that we don't have a devastating oil spill, for instance, the town of Odessa, Nickel, a little over a year ago. I mean, this was a serious, serious, devastating problem that especially indigenous peoples called attention to. So we've got an enormous contrast between official lines and what actually happens on the ground, surprise, surprise. We have an enormous contrast between the importance of the energy industry to Russia's economy and what happens to the people themselves who live in the parts of that energy industry in the North most affected. We have an enormous discrepancy in terms of what's happening in the North and Sea route. And so ecology becomes key to a way into activism. What has been important for me, though, is figuring out whether all these local ecology protests could link up and create some sort of a synergism in terms of building civil society. Some of that has been happening and was happening and is actually part of the ammunition that I use to think about why Putin was getting uncomfortable about the degree to which maybe civil society was getting out of control, maybe the economics were getting to serious point in terms of world sanctions after 2014 and its invasion of Crimea. I mean, this has been a slow burn, not only a shock in terms of what's just happened in the last 50 some days, uh, and one of the things that was happening was this so-called federation really was beginning to fall apart at the seams. Not fall apart in terms of separatism, don't get me wrong. The only people who declared separate need for independence were the Chechens, and you saw what happened to them. For those of you who don't know, the two Chechen wars have been absolutely devastating to the Chechen people themselves and have been kind of uh, emblematic of what Putin is willing to do, even within his own country. So we're way off of my <laughs> personal relationship to these issues, but I hope we're back on a bigger picture. Well, let me open it up to questions. So please, yeah, it's true. Hi, Professor Balsam. This was a really interesting talk, so thank you. But I was kind of curious if you could expand more on the uh, indigenous land activism, because I actually last semester wrote a paper for Professor Smith about activism at Lake Baikal and some of the environmentalist victories. Super. But it struck me that you, there wasn't really any success until ethnic Russians took part. So. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's so interesting. It's a combined ethnic and Boreat movement, but I wouldn't say there wasn't any success until Russians took over. I'd say there was a kind of co-leadership 
-hmm. But um, uh, Marina Rekhanova was working with Sergei Shapkhayev, who's a laureate. Marina is a Russian activist who's been given very serious worldwide awards for her bravery. I mean, these are these are people who really stuck their necks out. As as you know, the activism on Lake Baikal started in the Soviet period. Um, this is this has been a, a very long term movement, and and one of one of the the sort of flagship civil society exemplars of of both Soviet Union and Russia. And I like to think of it also as one of these places where we've got an example of indigenous people, of local non-Russians working well with Russian activists. It's not that there wasn't some tension. And I've actually written a, in another monograph on West Siberia about some of the tensions between ecology activists or Russians and indigenous people who are haunting. But, but I wouldn't say that that Baikal was an example of that. And, and um, uh, there were serious cases, though, of repression of that movement and some real dirty tricks involved to put pressure on the leaders. I, I don't think I'll, I'll go into details, but um, Rekhanova's son, for instance, was, um, was pretty much framed. Uh, and landed in jail. I mean, there, there are very serious cases of, of trying to curtail the actual effectiveness of ecology movements everywhere. And yet every once in a while, cases will come up that really do seem to be wins for civil society. Another one, I'm gonna go off Siberia now, but still in Russia, happened in Bashkortostan, which is one of the last places you expect. Uh, for real local activism. Again, Bashkir and Russians working together to stop um, basically uh, a decapitation of a mountain um, uh, for a mining industry ploy that was actually finally stopped. Um, this is just recently, within the last three years or so. Um, the Kushtai Hill, it's called. Um, I, I, I look for these cases where ecology activists actually have, have won. Other There's a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read it uh, in her words, and I apologize if I get any of the, <laughs> the names mispronounced here. Hello, my name is Maria Vushkova. I am an ethnic Boryat, and I represent the, the Boryats Against War movement you mentioned in your talk. Oh, great. We actually have four anti war videos on our YouTube channel. Yes. <laughs> free, free Boryatia Foundation. I'm gathering and analyzing data on Boryat involvement in the war in Ukraine and also in the in the Bucha um, war crimes. I am curious about the racial aspect of the accusations against Boryats, and also I wonder how we can counteract them as a Boryat activist group. Oh, that is such a beautiful question. Thank you so much. I am. Um, first of all, really impressed with this movement because it takes a lot of guts right now to come out against the war in Ukraine. People have families still, even if they're emigres, uh, they have families still in, in Moriatia. Uh, they, uh, uh, I, I know quite a few Saha who are really devastated and who really don't feel as if they can do a lot publicly in terms of these kinds of videos. But this has been one of the really important bright spots. It is extraordinarily serious that people then turn to this kind of opposition and say, oh, now wait a minute, um, these people are just separatists and then, or they, 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 they um, dismiss their, their genuine concerns. And one of the things that has been serious uh, in the Boryat Moscow official dynamic is how strong the Boryat culture and people really were. I, I actually think it's not an accident, and this is going a little beyond the question, but that, that Buryatia was the place where they really did a number on the land. They, they really gerrymandered their original territory, possibly because they felt greater threat from this consolidated Buddhist civilization. I'm not sure why people have been feeling so much threat. But it, it, racism is not usually the first thing I think of 
when I think of Russians' approaches to non-Russians inside of, of the Federation, it has to really be pointed out to me that this is a case where probably people were just simply prejudiced against them as Asians, amorphous Asians. Um, that horrible picture I showed you was such a mishmash of, 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 uh, of misunderstanding of, of the dish, different national identities and cultural traditions, much less a misunderstanding of where this is coming from politically. But it's a very easy and convenient thing to make that stereotype of non-Russians into people who are not only wild, out of control, but also secessionist. It's an excuse to crack down on you, among other things. If you call somebody a separatist, then you can throw them in jail. Uh, and so I think we've got to puzzle out how, as the questioner asks, uh, one can kind of counteract propaganda that's already just so messy. Some authorities say that if you actually address propaganda, you make it worse by kind of, uh, you know, you need to state your own positions clearly, but not actually go after the moments of, of prejudice because then you call attention to them. Um, I'm not sure that I understand enough about the workings of, of, of social media, particularly in a distorted Russian environment, to know whether it's a good thing to directly address that false flag or not. My intuition playing it straight is that one should say, hey, this is wrong and show where. Um, but uh, uh, again, I am fascinated that the Boreads have really become leaders in this process. I also wanna do a nod to some of the tensions given the background of this questioner. A nod to the issue of who is a national identity proud owner of a civilization and who is an indigenous person. Because sometimes some Buryats I've met have been worried about the word indigenous. They're not seeing it in terms of United Nations politics and solidarity necessarily. Although, and here comes a really interesting new development, larger numbered peoples with their own republics, Buryats, Saha, Tuh, Tuvans included, and others are getting together now with some of the smaller numbered indigenous peoples in an emigre forum that was just going on this past weekend informally as plans are being made for who should be out front and how to do it in terms of native peoples against the war in Ukraine. I could just add a footnote as a historian of World War II, the racist element here was jumped out at me because when the Red Army marched into Germany and the mass rapes happened at the end of World War II, um, it became a kind of commonplace to blame it on the Central Asians, not mm. even mm. Ed among educated Russians. That's so it right. seems I mean, to me that by you know honoring the guard you know, or elevating the unit uh, into a guard unit, that Putin has just done, and then sort of putting out the fact that there were Buryats there it plays into that within the Russian Federation to blame right, the, right. the others. And incidentally, point of information, and of course, facts on the ground are tricky to come by. It doesn't look like there were too many non-Russians in Bucha, but a Western reporter found remnants of Tuvan language materials and materials about the Dalai Lama. My heart so goes out to the soldiers who might have been reading about the Dalai Lama in Bucha and being ashamed of what was going on. It is very possible they were recruits and hardly willing participants in the atrocities. Yeah, thank you, Maria. It's such an interesting talk. I think I have like 11 questions, but in, in, in honor of the series tradition, I'll go with one. <laughs> Uh, and that is just jumping in on this this last discussion and thinking about the way that the state, the Russian state, has dealt with independence movements uh, and creating new narratives. I keep thinking about how Ukraine right now 
you know, there's this outsized role for Chechens. Oh, and then there, it's you know, the opposite, right? Like that they that they've embraced this narrative that we're like wild men, and we're the fiercest, and we're you know the the cold own regiment. Um, but it's hard to know what to make of that. You know, like what do we make of that? That here is this this republic that itself was devastated by war, and that no, that absolutely what we have is a very odd situation in which a leader originally a mullah Kadyrov senior yeah. switched sides in the Chechen war and his son became Putin's almost adopted son some people say Ramzan Kadyrov was taken over and made into what he is today and maybe even went farther in some ways than Putin himself in terms of a trade-off. I'll be technically loyal to Moscow and stay within Russian so-called Federation if you let me run my fiefdom the way I want to run it as a military dictatorship. So when Ramzan is called off by Putin to bring his troops and people into Ukraine, what was their role supposed to be? People have said they were not supposed to be in the front lines. They were the cleanup crew. They were supposed to be the operation after various towns had been occupied. And before I go any farther, you, meant, you, you heard me perhaps, I said it quickly, say that there's almost like a mini Chechen war going on inside of there are others left over from emigrate Chechen populations and people, I shouldn't say populations, who, who are called the Ichkarians. They're the people who are still secessionists and still revolutionary and anti ramzan Kadyrov, and they have joined forces with the Ukrainian forces. So we've got Chechens fighting Chechens inside of Ukraine. This is a little mini story waiting to be properly reported on. I'm only giving you what I've been able to pick out of various uh, media sources and, and not my kind of direct line that I have with, with Siberian people. Um, so uh, that's, that's the best I can do to say that there's a particular, very special relationship which has created the status that Chechnya has had inside of Russia, which is different from any of the other republics. Well, I saw a number of questions, so let's gather the Hi. remaining questions, please. Hi, Hi. My, name, my name is Zarina uh, Salativa. I'm from the smallest region in Russia. I'm from Ingushetia. Ah! So, yeah, I, uh, I, ident I identify ourselves uh, as indigenous, but according to Russian law, we are like ethnic minority. Right. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, about uh, Kadyrov, I, I don't want to call uh, these people like Chechens and who are fighting from the Russian side. Uh, and for Chechens, they are also Kadyrov, they're not Chechen because they are oppressing people inside of uh, the Chechen Republic too. So yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah. So uh, my question is, um, I talk to activists from uh, the North Caucasian region, I mean, from Dagestan, Chechnya, Ingushetia, Kabardina, Balkaria, Karachao, Chekesia, etc. And we are now a little bit afraid what will happen with uh, Russia after this war. I mean, in the terms of uh, federalization, too. For example, if there will be a collapse, uh, another collapse of, uh, of the federation. Um, uh, the changing of the regime. Will it be possible that after this changing, we will have a we, uh, we can have a more federalization and more autonomy in the terms of culture, uh, uh, preser preservation of languages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, and it's it's not only about the North Caucasus, but also in other regions of uh, Russia. For example, I know that uh, Bashkir activists they are already talking about. Uh, how they will they will survive 
after the collapse of the federation ah. because they are waiting for independence or something like well much course time would have a little bit of trouble right in the middle of the Volga region <laughs> <laughs> having any kind of secession uh, given that they're not out of border but, but your point about federalism changing and of course it's changed in our lifetime in the in, in the post-soviet period in lots of different ways and one of the points I was trying to make is when you curtail people's cultural and political freedoms that they were beginning to have, that makes them far angrier. I mean, this is, separatism starts from Moscow policy, not from, from the regions themselves, which would perhaps enjoy having real federalism. But what we've been having with Russia, of course, is not any kind of real federalism in the sense that we in the United States understand. And therefore, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cop out on the future. I can't say, you know, that Russia is going to fall apart. But certainly, this has made Russia so much more unstable, not more stable. More stable would have been to allow for the flourishing of all of these different cultures and peoples and languages at each level as people wanted it to be on the ground. In other words, let those horizontal civilizational ties flourish let people have a chance for language education inside of their schools. Don't curtail that as they did in 2016 or in the most recent constitution amendments where they made the Russian language the key language of the consolidated people of Russia, the Russians. It's obviously offensive, it's obviously polarizing, and it could radicalize people. Instead of going the direction of, of of the two of the men I showed you, the historian Bill Chiday, who had been secessionist and then wanted to make more accommodation with Russia as long as the Republic could flourish. Instead of that, with no flourishing and unemployment in your homeland, reaching about 30%, which I just read this yeah. morning, I, you know, the, the, the yeah, unemployment I, figures are huge in the North Caucasus. And Inga Shachia, unfortunately, yeah. is one of those places. And therefore, Yes, young people are going to be angry. I hope, frankly, that they can come to some sort of a solution with regime change that doesn't cause Russia to fall apart. I'm not somebody who's written this book to say, to advocate sovereignty that mm -hmm. Russia should fall apart. And a lot of people have some, not a lot, but some people have misunderstood my motives. I've, I've never said that. And I try to take clues about degrees of radicalism from my interlocutors. I would never attribute it to anyone else. Um, and Michael, if it's okay with you, I, I think as we're coming to a close, I wanna actually read a more hopeful moment that comes from uh, an activist. Uh, and I actually think I'm, I'm going to name her. Yes, this is somebody from my Siberian compound um, uh, write, writing uh, uh, the following trying to explain to somebody on her dissertation committee. There is a huge cultural revitalization back in my homeland. People in my republic are returning to their ancestral beliefs. This means that they finally begin to understand who they are and start to discover their inner strength, which was almost broken by all those events in our recent history. It's difficult to stand up for our rights and there may not be enough time we don't know for sure, but we need to try. Well, so um, we've only been able to scratch the surface of many of the rich themes here. I do want to tell you that the publisher was able to give a discount. So there's a QR code in the back for those of you who would like to read it. And I just want to thank you very much for illuminating so many things this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.